All right, let's start by talking about the muscles we're going to use in breathing. So we're going to talk about inhalation and exhalation. So let's start with inhalation. Remember, when we're inhaling, our goal is to expand the lungs, which will lower the pressure inside them and draw air in. So when we talk about inhalation, we're going to talk about two different kinds. There's quiet inhalation and deep inhalation. Quiet inhalation is what we're doing when we're not really thinking about it too much. We're relatively calm. So when you're just doing unconscious breathing, when you're sitting there writing, you're still breathing. You're just not really thinking about it. The breathing you're doing there is quiet inhalation. And the main muscle involved in that is the diaphragm. So quiet inhalation primarily involves the diaphragm, which in this case is largely being controlled by the pons and medulla. There's some centers in there that do automatic breathing when you're not really thinking about it. Primarily, they will cause the diaphragm to contract once every four to six seconds and then relax. So contracting will pull the bottoms of the lungs down. It pulls down the parietal pleura, which sucks the visceral pleura along with it, which expands the lungs, causing inhalation. The other set of muscles that can be involved in quiet inhalation are the scalenes, which are kind of up in this area and mostly are going to be lifting the top rib a little bit. So they're expanding the top of the chest cavity just a little bit during quiet inhalation. Not as important as the diaphragm. Focus on the diaphragm for that. But of course, sometimes we want to breathe more deeply than that. So when you either are exerting yourself in which case you'll do this unconsciously, or when you consciously take a deep breath, try this yourself. Take a deep breath and then pause partway through and pay attention to what's going on in your body. So let's see. Okay, when I think about what's going on, I can feel tension here in my rib cage and here in my neck. So the muscles involved here, primarily between the ribs, the external intercostals, Inter between costal rib. So these are muscles between the ribs that pull the ribs upward and outward. So when I'm taking my breath, notice my chest expanding. That's a lar largely that's the inter the external intercostals pulling the lungs up and out. The other muscle that's involved here is the sternocleidomastoid between the mastoid process here and the sternum and clavicle. That's going to lift the clavicles up a little bit and expand the upper chest cavity some. So the sternocleidomastoid. Those muscles are, rel you, those are relatively easy to feel. If you turn your head to the side, you can feel it right there, coming down from here, down along there. So when you're breathing in deeply, there's gonna be some tension in those as they pull this up. Now, if you've ever done vocal music, you may know that your voice instructor will say, breathe from the diaphragm, because when you're doing vocal music, if you take deep breaths up here, you're doing all sorts of things to put tension on your neck and throat, which is going to change the way you sing. So instead, they recommend breathe from the diaphragm, which doesn't move this around nearly as much. It just pooches your stomach out, but it still lets you take a pretty deep breath. You just focus on that. Anyway, back to this. So to inhale, we use the diaphragm, scalenes, external intercostals, sternocleidomastoid. All of that expands the chest cavity and it brings the lungs outward and allows air to come in. So what about exhalation? Well, here again, we're gonna talk about two kinds, passive and active. Passive exhalation is the easy one. In passive exhalation, we're going to take advantage of the fact that our lungs have a natural tendency to collapse. And when they do, we don't have to do anything to make that happen. That's just coming from that internal elasticity around the alveoli and from the surface tension. So all I have to do to a passive exhalation is stop inhaling. If I've breathed in with my diaphragm and then I just stop contracting the diaphragm, 
the natural elasticity of the lungs will cause them to pull the diaphragm back up as they compress. That will then put lower the volume, which raises the pressure, which causes the air to come out. So all I have to do is go and then and as that's my lungs naturally recoiling, going back to a more intermediate state. But sometimes I need a deep one. So if I'm doing passive, that's no muscles involved. All I have to do is stop contracting the muscles of inhalation. But for an active exhalation, well, it's a little more active, logically enough. So try it again like we did with the inhalation. Take in a breath and then blow it out hard and fast, but pause partway through and pay attention to what's going on. So we go, and then, okay, now, I can feel that my ribs are coming in and I feel tension here in my abdominal muscles. In the ribs, the muscle that's contracting is the internal intercostals. These are muscles deep to the externals that bring the ribs downward and inward, kind of antagonist to those. That's going to compress the rib cage inward, compressing the lungs and forcing air out, making the volume smaller and increasing the pressure more. The other thing was the abdominals. Those are down here, so it's harder to see how they're gonna be involved. But the abdominals, when they contract, put pressure on the abdominal cavity which is going to add pressure up this way, both by shoving some of the internal organs up against the diaphragm and just by increasing the pressure here. That will tend to push everything up this way, which will again, decrease the volume of the lungs and force air out. The internal intercostals and the abdominal muscles. So those are the muscles involved in ventilation, breathing in and breathing out. One interesting thing we're gonna to touch on later Passive exhalation does not involve muscles. It involves using the natural elasticity of the lungs. But there are some conditions which interfere with that. For example, emph <clears throat> excuse me, emphysema is the destruction of the alveolar walls. So the individual alveoli break down their walls and join together into larger alveoli. That has one major problem, which is the loss of surface area. But another problem is since we're losing all of that elastic fiber, the lung actually has less recoil. It's easier to expand it, but then when you stop expanding it, it doesn't have nearly as much recoil, so it doesn't tend to compress on its own and you don't get passive exhalation. Sometimes people with emphysema have to force themselves to exhale. They'll breathe in and then they have to push air out in order to be sure that they exhale. Otherwise it would be and nothing would happen. So. Some interesting stuff about the muscles of ventilation. Now, when we in the next part we're gonna do in a little bit here, we're going to look at the amount of air we tend to move on, a, on breathing, which was similar to what we did in lab 19. All right, so now we're going to talk about one more interesting aspect of ventilation and the volumes we breathe, which is the idea of total versus alveolar ventilation. This has to do with the idea that of the air we breathe in, not all of it gets to our alveoli. Remember, we have all of these conducting passageways and the air that stays in those doesn't actually help us in terms of gas exchange. So to do that, we have to talk about the concept of dead space. So what I'm going to do first is something you've probably wanted to do since the first exam, which is to put Dr. Leguber on the bottom of a lake. So here's the surface of our water, here's the lake bottom, and my good friend, Dr. Leguber, will be here. Let's give him somebody to keep him company. Little fish. Um, really, we should have a giant squid or something in here too, shouldn't we? No, let's... There we go. Okay, anyway. Now, because we want Dr. Leguber to survive, at least I do at this point, I'm going to give him a snorkel. Now, we're going to ignore the fact that if he's under what looks like about mm, 10 feet of water, it's probably pretty hard to breathe through a snorkel because of the pressure here. We're just gonna say he's got really strong, really strong lungs, really strong muscles. Anyway, so 
When Dr. Leguber is breathing through this snorkel, let's say the snorkel has a total volume of 1,000 milliliters. So if Dr. Leguber takes a tidal breath of 500 milliliters, a standard tidal volume, he breathes in, 500 milliliters of air comes in here, 500 milliliters of air enters his lungs, then he breathes out. So 500 milliliters of air goes out. Think about where that air goes. That's going into the snorkel, but only up to about here. Does any of that air he just exhaled come out the top? There might be some mixing, but not much. Which means the next time he inhales 500 milliliters, he gets mostly the air he just exhaled. That air is now coming back. And then he exhales it again, and then inhales it, and then exhales it. You get the idea here that he's not really getting much fresh air. Think about this. If he wanted to take in a breath and get 500 milliliters of fresh air into his body, how big of a breath would he have to take? Looks to me like if he wanted to take get 500 milliliters of fresh air, he would need to breathe in 1,500 milliliters because he would need to breathe in enough to get everything out of the snorkel plus another 500 milliliters of fresh air. When he then breathes out that 1,500, 500 of it comes out, the other 1,000 is now filling the snorkel. So when he breathes in his next breath, he needs to clear that out and get 500 more. This space that's really just air that he's just moving around every time he inhales and exhales, it's not fresh air, is what we call dead space. Dead space is just the volume of air that you're going to move on each breath that just goes toward filling the passages that lead to your lungs. That's not air that you're actually getting that's fresh air to your alveoli. Now this is an example where he's got a snorkel that he has to clear. But you can imagine that you have some dead space built into your own lungs. When you breathe in, actually let's start with breathing out. I breathe out. And when I'm done breathing out, the air that's filling my bronchioles, bronchi, trachea, larynx, pharynx, nasal cavity, all of that is air that was in my lungs. That's now stale air. So when I next breathe in, the first air that gets to my alveoli is the air from my nasal cavity and pharynx and trachea and bronchi and bronchioles, which is the same air I was exhaling last time. All of that, all those conducting passages, are dead space, what we call anatomical dead space. That anatomical dead space, that's the stuff that's your bronchioles, bronchi, trachea, larynx, all of those conducting passageways. And all together, in a body like mine, that comes out to about 150 milliliters of space. That space that is filled with stale air after every exhalation, since that's the first air you get into your alveoli, when you think about how much fresh air do I get to my alveoli on each breath, I have to subtract the stuff that just went toward clearing the dead space. So let's, th let's think about how that's going to work. So erase, and let's do a calculation. So, from each 500 milliliter tidal breath, how much fresh air gets to my alveoli? To answer that, we would have to say, what's my total, my total air moved on the breath, so the total ventilation, which was a 500 milliliter breath, minus the dead space, minus 150 milliliters, equals what we call the alveolar ventilation, which in this case is 350 milliliters. So out of that 500 milliliter tidal breath, only about 350 is fresh air getting into my alveoli, which is okay. That's why I take that size of a breath, to get that much fresh air to my alveoli. 
But that does mean that there's going to be some interesting stuff when we think about, is there a difference between breathing deeply and breathing shallowly, even if I'm going to move the same amount of total air? So let's talk about how those calculations will work, because it is very possible that there will be such a calculation on an exam. Let's take two individuals, Ailsa takes, let's say she takes 15 500 milliliter breaths per minute. Baruch takes 10 750 milliliter breaths per minute. For each of them, calculate their total ventilation in terms of how much air they move per minute altogether, and their alveolar ventilation, which is how much fresh air gets to their alveoli in the course of that minute. To do that, you're going to need to calculate their total ventilation by how, many, how much air they move on each breath times the number of breaths they take per minute. And then for their alveolar ventilation, you'll need to calculate how much fresh air gets to their alveoli every minute, which means taking account the dead space, 150 milliliters, off of each breath, then multiplying it by the total number of breaths per minute. So try that right now, and then we'll all work through the solution in just a moment. Okay, for Ailsa, her total ventilation works out to 500 milliliters per breath times 15 breaths per minute gives me a total of 7,500 milliliters per minute of total ventilation. But now let's look at her alveolar ventilation. Actually, let's do Baruch first. Baruch took 750 milliliters per breath times 10 breaths per minute gives me 7,500 milliliters per minute. These two people are moving the same amount of air in and out of their noses in the course of that minute, even though Baruch is breathing more slowly but a little more deeply. They end up the same on their, on their total ventilation. But what about their alveolar ventilation? All right, let's figure that out for Ailsa. So she was taking 500 milliliters per breath, but we now have to take into account the fact that 150 of each breath is wasted in just clearing the dead space. So it's really 500 minus 150 milliliters per breath times her 15 breaths per minute. So 500 minus 150 is 350 times 15 that comes out to 5,250 milliliters per minute. So out of her 7,500 milliliters of total ventilation, 5,250 was, was actually useful fresh air. How about for Baruch? He was taking 750 milliliter breaths we still have to remove the 150 milliliters for the dead space. And he took 10 of those per minute. That comes out to... 6,000 milliliters per minute. So even though they're moving the same amount of air, Baruch actually gets a little bit more fresh air to his alveoli by breathing a little bit slower and a little bit more deeply. So there actually is a difference to how these affect your body. Slower, deeper breathing is more effective at providing oxygen and getting rid of CO2. The oxygen, as it turns out, is less important than getting rid of the CO2 in terms of how that affects the way we breathe. So we'll talk about that a little later when we talk about how we regulate our breathing.
But you will have to do a calculation like something like this on the exam. So keep in mind, total ventilation is just the amount of air you move on each breath times the breaths per minute. For alveolar ventilation, you have to subtract the dead space, which unless you're told otherwise is 150 milliliters, from each breath before multiplying it by the number of breaths per minute.